so yeah, as Lee mentioned, that's a perfect segue into um, what I'll be doing is just taking a, a snapshot look at some of the things that have been done in the Hume region. So it takes in both the Golden Broken and the northeast catchments in this part of the of the border, or this south of the border. And I'll be looking, as, as Lee mentioned, uh, at a quick snapshot of, at one of the smaller native fish, We're looking at a project associated with a, a, the iconic speed, uh, fish species, which you can probably already guess, and another medium-sized uh, native fish. In that short time, we've got a barbel. So, and the first one is, uh, is one of those small ones that Lee mentioned before. And so this is a species restricted to the Golden Broken. It's one which is only found in trout-free waters, so you can already gain uh, or glean one of the threatening processes associated with that species. And it's generally in, in uh, cooler waters and um, is, is one that's pretty well restricted to public land areas, generally in forest situations. Oh, sorry, how's that? Better again? Right -o. Um And it's one that's been subject to lots of lots of the things that we've already talked or heard today. Things like climate change, things like um, drought cycles and um, fire impacts on, on the limited catchments that are available. And they're just some of the things that have been <coughs> undertaken. So post fire events has been um, recognition of the importance of existing natural and including artificial barriers to, to trout to maintain trout free areas. And initially there was a little bit of pushback from um, the angling fraternity and there probably wasn't the best form of engagement with, with that important stakeholder group where it was thought that this was going to be the thin end of the wedge and a takeover in terms of conservation fish biologists wanting to take over large areas of trout streams and it's far from it. It's the, it's, it's the tiny and small areas that we might be able to manage in this manner to keep very small areas trout free and there's really a great buy-in from the angling community now in recognition and great and active participation by angling groups including trout fraternities in, in helping to keep these areas free. So there's been things like drought refuge, um, salvage, temporary collection posts. We've had, few have had some fire events. Uh, 03 is Great Divide range um, fires in 03. <coughs> We've had um, big fires in, in um, 06, um, Black Saturday fires, and all of those have had impacts on um, making small drought refuges very vulnerable to, to sediment events. And so we've had everything from short-term collections to captive breeding and then following up further works to improve spawning and natural recruitment. So there's been some really positive works with the community uh, and a range of stakeholders in that. Uh, just going to quickly go on to the iconic one, and there's lots of projects, lots of different work that's um, being undertaken with uh, Murray Cod, but this is an interesting one that's relating to um, the relationship with Dartmouth Dam, and the, so Dartmouth went in in 1979, and there's, there's links to, as Lee was mentioning, with carp, and uh, we'll follow up further with the, the story on carp, but just cold water pollution that occurred downstream of um, the Dartmouth Dam and there was concerns about what the impacts were on, on Murray Cod populations. And so there's a whole lot of research that uh, Zeb Tonkin and Arthur Island Institute, so our research arm of DELT that are doing um, in conjunction with the community and particularly with the CMA. So there's a double up work in terms of population management, um, looking at the, the hydrological um, aspects of the the management of Dartmouth Dam to better manage for native fish populations. So there's a, quite a lot of work done and so in terms of the research work, um, things that are, there's acoustic uh, loggers that are being used, so an, an array of receivers to be able to virtually track where um, Murray Cod are uh, moving. And I'll just show you one of the, one of the uh, uh, species that, uh, sorry, one of, this, one of the fish which are, 25 tagged fish. And if you look at the fish initially in the early um, pre spawning phase, it hung around in that neck of the woods. And then going into a spawning phase thereafter, did do some runs. And you sort of get a, a gauge of the, the scale. So it's a matter of kilometres, not huge, and not as many as we've had um, on other river systems, the Murray and the Ovens. And, uh, where there's hundreds of kilometres of, um, involved in spawning runs. So just an illustration of the sort of work that can be done to reiterate that Murray Cod are still in the system, they are recruiting and there's young in the system, but 
uh, so as to better manage works that are ultimately going to uh, lead into linked projects. And I mentioned the, the work, and Lee already mentioned um, re-snagging is one of the active works that uh, the CMA is uh, undertaking. So North East CMA with big government funding, so recreational fishing funding to improve the habitat. And we know the, the link between large in-stream woody habitat and um, providing food and shelter for species like Murray Cod. And I quickly um, mentioned another species which is back perch. So, and Lee already mentioned back perch. One of the species which used to be ubiquitous across the Murray Darling Basin one that's declined significantly, and one in terms of the ovens, which um, we effectively called extinct. So from a species which used to be locally abundant or co-dominant, co, co at least in the uh, lower and mid ovens and all the way up the catchment, to become virtually extinct, bar a small remnant population in the buffalo. So again, this is a, a project working in, in uh, co conjunction with our research wing of Arthur Oil Institute and ZEV. Um, so the historical distribution there, and as Lee already indicated, used to be right through the Murray-Darling Basin, but this is a, a gauge from the northeast part of the world. And uh, I'll just sort of focus on the two viable populations still in Victoria, one Dartmouth and one the Yarra. So over there, Dartmouth and, and the Yarra. Interestingly, one's a, uh, a lake population now, so obviously an artefact of having been dammed in 1979. And one's another artefact in terms of being a translocated population outside of its natural range. Um, and there's a whole series of other populations which are really um, probably on, on, the, on the cutting edge of being viable or not, but there's some really good works that are being undertaken by the Golden, Bro Golden Broken CMA and Arthur Island Institute and community and angling groups. Um, places like King Parrot Creek, Hughes Creek, Sevens Creek, and they're all again related to that story of post-fire impacts, small drought refuge, uh, tr uh, collections, translocations, and habitat improvement works that are all happening in those systems. So I'm going to quickly focus though on the uh, on the ovens. So there's and the, and the aims were: can we re-establish a viable population, a self-sustaining population of mac perch in the oven? So that was our project brief. And can we do it in a short period of time? And it's a really important thing. We're going to value add on. Um, existing works, and there's a whole plethora, a fantastic amount of work, research work in particular that's been done again by agencies, um, both Arthur Island Institute and DPI in New South and others, to understand the mechanisms, that, that fish ecology that Lee talked about. And one of the great examples locally was the de demonstration research works, which was MDBA um, funded again in association with Arthur Island Institute and, and North East CMA landholders in particular and the angling fraternity to recognise the value of removing woody, um, exotic woody weeds, um, improving native riparian vegetation, looking at fishways, looking at grazing management, the value of fencing riparian vegetation to make an integrated system and that's building on the legacy of stuff that um, we're going to hear soon about um, carp but there's also lots of work that's been done to help restore the balance and get back a viable entity for native fish, even in, even in the absence of some exciting stuff that's coming up soon. And all the way along, um, the important thing that we're really focusing on is, is community education and awareness. It's a two-pronged approach that we're doing, and it's based also, and I know John Cairns in the room here, based on a, a really good model that was pioneered with trout cod to re-establish uh, a viable population of trout caught at the ovens, which was done in the mid-90s, initiated over a 10-year fingling stocking period. We're replicating that. We're doing it on the basis that the ovens is in reasonably good nick. It's not overly regulated. It's got some really good works happening. The carp balance is coming back into, um, into balance uh, through associated works with community groups and ARI in, in eradication programs. But the system, the water quality and the quantity is getting viable, and it's made an opportunity to to restore these species. So it's that rewilding that we talked about. And so two-pronged approach. The novel part is not only fingling stockings, and to date over a three-year period, over 60,000 through uh, Snobs Creek fish hatchery, but the novel part is taking in a viable manner from the healthy Dartmouth Dam population. So not robbing Peter to pay Paul, making the use, and we had heard it earlier today, post the millennium drought, really good science that ARI have been involved with determining that we've got a population recruitment, a really good population pulse that we can viably take 
relatively small numbers, or they were up to now uh, 1,200 or so small to larger sized fish to translocate from Dartmouth directly into the ovens, and it was being done today as well. And I'll be getting to that point, which is shown here with um, the community um, input, and we've got uh, representatives from the Wang Sustainability Network, the Restoring Our Work Waterways Group, which are actively doing that today with our ARI and DELT people from Hume Region. This is just showing that we've uh, some of the brood stock fish that were recently released back into the ovens. Um, community education is really important thing, so we, we've, we've got lots of mechanisms to make sure that people are aware and on board, and that's including everyone from landholders to the angling fraternity. Lots of mechanisms, are really good YouTubes coming on. Delp, if you want to have a look, there's one being recently released. Um, heaps of partnerships, and it's important that the community is on board, and that's everyone from locals to uh, a number of agencies, and we thank their help. Uh, and importantly, there's some real link with some funding, and I'm going to mention in a moment that um, we've had both joint state and federal funding, and it's been uh, value added by community and uh, other internal processes. It's a really important um, process, and lots of um, there's a whole heap of groups there, but I do, do want to help uh, mention the Wank Sustainability Network again. Heaps of people within Necro, Delt, and um, uh, Fisheries Victoria. And so I just want to conclude and reiterate the, the only way in which we've been able to make the use of some funding, and so funding is really important, is on the back of foundation research and foundation knowledge. It's a little bit like what Lee was talking about, having an understanding of the, of the ecology, aware of what, recognising what our assets are, knowing what the threats are, and then making the link to be able to do some actions. Partnerships are really important. The, the funding is really critical and gee, it's a really fantastic option that we've got some viable projects to be able to make use of fantastic <laughs> options for a northeast conservation fund so we can always do some more and we've really value it um, and once again really appreciate and acknowledge the importance of community engagement and ownership in the process. Thank you.